Well, a very warm welcome this morning as we gather together. Uh, we might be separated by distance, but we join together by the Spirit in the name of the Lord Jesus, the risen Lord Jesus. For although last Sunday was Easter Sunday, we continue to gather in this Easter tide and Jesus is risen. And wherever we find ourselves this morning, he is present with us by his Spirit. A special welcome to our regulars at St Paul's. If you're somebody perhaps who's found us online and is joining us from the local community, maybe you're somebody who's joining us because this whole situation has raised some really big questions for you and you're just wanting to find out more. Whoever you are, a really special welcome uh, this morning. We do hope you find it helpful. One or two pieces of church family news or uh, uh, news to keep you updated. Uh, the first is to say the PCC, the Church Council, is continuing to monitor our finances as a church and make decisions in light of that. And we'll uh, write out to the uh, church family in the days to come just to keep you updated on some of those things and those decisions. But one or two to share now. Uh, the first is to please keep praying for Christians Against Poverty and the Bridge Project. Uh, they are two of the projects we support through our outside support fund. And we've decided as a church that it's right to continue to give them to a first gift this year, a financial gift, particularly because they are working at the front line in this crisis. Christians Against Poverty supporting those in debt and the Bridge Project, more locally in Blackpool, supporting the homeless and vulnerable. And they are doing a sterling work at this time. And so we thought it was right to give to them even at this point. Uh, also to say that we're in the process of considering forming a hardship fund as a church and uh, we'll be thinking about that and doing some more discussions as a PCC but that will, if, uh, if we're able to bring it together, be a fund that will be able to so support people in church or known to us through church who might find themselves in real difficulty at this time and that we'd be able to give them a little gift just to support them uh, through this process. So again, we'll let you know uh, as those plans become clearer. Uh, one or two other things to say, please do keep looking out on the regular emails if you're getting those, uh, just to keep you updated about different bits of news. Uh, but this Wednesday coming, this Wednesday at half past seven, we're going to have an online prayer meeting. And uh, I recognise not everyone will be able to join us for that. But if you're on Zoom, uh, there will be an online prayer meeting. We'll meet together for perhaps half an hour and uh, we uh, will be praying for a number of things. If you'd like to be involved in that, please do get in contact with me and uh, I can let you know uh, the details of that. We had our first online youth group earlier this week. That was great fun and uh, we're going to continue that as a, a weekly thing uh, in the days uh, ahead. Well, uh, I think that's uh, enough notices for the moment, but uh, there are so many things we can be praying for. Please do keep praying and looking out for news for things that we can be supporting before the Lord in prayer. Uh, let's just have a moment's pause and uh, we're going to just be quiet. Uh, easy perhaps to, uh, when we're at home, just uh, flick on the computer and watch this and perhaps really not really have, uh, as it were, concentrated in our hearts and minds. There's still other things in, in our heads. So let's just have a pause and just quieten our hearts before the Lord and I'll lead us in prayer. Father God, we do ask and pray that you would meet with us now. Meet with us, Heavenly Father, wherever we find ourselves and draw us closer to yourself. Fill us with hope in the risen Lord Jesus and cause us to follow him all our days. Amen. Well, we're going to use these words to begin our time together. Uh, these are words that are taken from 2 Timothy and words that are, were an early creed in one sense, but words that remind us of the hope that we have uh, if we're trusting the Lord Jesus. We, we join in all the words in bold together today. Here are words you may trust. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead. He is our salvation, our eternal glory. If we die with him, we shall live with him. If we endure, we shall reign with him. If we deny him, 
he will deny us. If we are faithless, he keeps faith. For he has broken the power of death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Aren't those wonderful words? He has brought life and immortality to life. And we're going to sing of that risen king now. It's a song that uh, we sing at St Paul's, but uh, it reminds us, particularly in the second one, that we come in this Easter period, a period of joy, but of course not all our experience in that period is one of happiness. And so that second verse says, Come, those whose joy is morning sun, those who this morning are excited to be gathering together, but also those who actually have found themselves weeping lots in these past days. Whoever you are, whatever stage you join ourselves in today, let's come to the risen King and tune our hearts to him. Come people of the risen King. Bible passage later, and it doesn't matter if you're young or old, we can all take part in this. 
Now, there are some things in life which, to be honest, we would find it hard to believe unless we saw them with our own eyes. We'd say, no, I'm not sure I can believe that unless I saw it. Let me test you out on a few. See if you believe whether I'm telling you the truth or not, or whether you'd only believe it if you saw it. The first is a rainbow of cars. A rainbow of cars. Would you believe that? Or would you need to see that with your own eyes? I wonder what you're thinking. Well, let's have a look and see if I can show you one. There you go, there you go. Actually, it's not so difficult to do, though very impressive, isn't it? Very topical at the moment. I'm not sure you could get one of those in your front window at the moment. What about this one? An iceberg in the shape of Batman. An iceberg in the shape of Batman. Is that something you'd believe? Or would you need to see it with your own eyes? What, what do you reckon? Mm, have a chat, perhaps, if you've got someone else there. Well, go on, let me see if I can show you. What do you reckon? Do you think it's true? Ah, oh, you can see it with your own eyes. There you are. <laughs> An iceberg in the shape of Batman. I wonder where Robin is. OK, what about this next one? OK, a butterfly that has the number 80 written on its wings, OK? A butterfly that has the number 80 on its wings, not because someone's drawn it on. Do you believe that? Or would you need to see that with your own eyes? Well, I wonder. OK, let's see if I can show you that. Can I? Mm, not sure if I can. Actually, I can. Isn't that amazing? That's not been photoshopped. That's just occurred in nature. A butterfly with a number 80. OK, last one. What about a chilli that is rainbow coloured? OK, a chilli that is rainbow coloured. What do you reckon? See that with your own eyes or do you believe that? Well, go on then. Let's do this last thing. There you are. That's not so bad, is it? That's a, a chilli that goes from hot to cool all in one chilli. There are some things we would only believe with our own eyes, but other things... Actually, we would believe in, in fact, we do believe in, because someone else we trust has seen it for themselves. In fact, there are loads of things in life that I have never seen with my own eyes, but I trust that they exist because someone else or something else has seen them, and I trust that source. So some things we might say, no, I'll only believe that if I see it, but that's not really how life works. There are loads of things that we trust because someone else has and today we're going to meet a man who's struggling with that whole idea and we'll find out what happened. But we'll come back to that a little later. Before we go any further, we're going to say sorry to God. And uh, wonderfully in that song, we, we sang that his mercy never ceases. Uh, the Bible says elsewhere that each day his mercies are new. His mercy is him not treating us as we deserve. That is how God treats Jesus' people. And so what we're going to do, we're going to use some words to say sorry to God, but let's just pause and close our eyes, just reflect over this last week before we use these words to say sorry to God uh, together. So let's close our eyes and just be silent. Christ died to sin once for all, and now he lives to God. Let us renew our resolve to have done with all that is evil, and confess our sins in penitence and faith. Jesus Christ, risen Master and triumphant Lord, we come to you in sorrow for our sins, and confess to you our weakness and unbelief. We have lived by our own strength and not by the power of your resurrection. In your mercy forgive us. Lord, hear us and help us. We have lived by the light of our own eyes as faithless and not believing. In your mercy forgive us. Lord, hear us and help us. We have lived for this world alone and doubted our home in heaven. In your mercy, forgive us. Lord, hear us and help us. For his perfect love will never change, his mercies never cease. 
And because of that, we hear this promise when we come in repentance and faith. May the Father forgive us by the death of his Son and strengthen us to live in the power of the Spirit all our days. Amen. Let me lead us in the collect for today. Almighty Father, you have given your only Son to die for our sins and to rise again for our justification. Grant us so to put away the leaven of malice and wickedness, that we may always serve you in pureness of living and truth, through the merits of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. God is always deserving of praise and glory and uh, we're going to come and reflect that glory that is there in the whole universe that one day the whole universe will give to God and we're going to echo that in the here and now. So let's use these words to glorify our God together. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. We're going to have our first Bible reading to us now from Acts chapter 2. Spoken by Peter on the day of Pentecost as the Spirit filled him and as he declared Jesus to be Lord of all because he is the one that is risen. We're now going to have our reading brought to us from Acts chapter 2. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders and signs which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. He will not let his Holy One see decay. 
Well, that's a wonderful truth. Thank you, Kieran, so much for reading our reading for us. Uh, we're going to sing of that truth more now and take ourselves to sing of the day of resurrection. Let's join in with joyful hearts. The Day of Resurrection. According to John, glory to you, O Lord. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear among of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said, Unless I see the, the unless I see the nail mark in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later the disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the, the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your fingers here, see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. 
This is the Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, O Christ. Well, as we come to think on God's word, let's pray together for his Spirit's help. Father God, you sent your Spirit and caused your apostles to write what you wanted them to write. Father, as John records these events that he witnessed, may your Spirit work in us that we might understand your word and that it might bring us life. We pray that for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Well, let's come to these words from John chapter 20 together. Uh, the story is told of a man who went on holiday to the Middle East uh, with his wife and his mother-in-law. Uh, very tragically, while he was there, though, his mother-in-law died. Uh, well, the man went to the British consulate with death certificate in hand to arrange the repatriation of her body. Uh, the family was very touched at this man's efforts. Well, the consul advised the man that to repatriate the body would cost £5,000, but to bury the body in Jerusalem would just be £150. And he went on to explain that because of the difference in cost, most people chose uh, to bury their deceased there in Jerusalem. Uh, the man, though, was undeterred, and he informed the consul that no, no, only repatriation would do, and he got his checkbook out and started to write the cheque. Well, at this point, the consul now was also touched by the man's efforts and his clear love for his mother-in-law. He said to the man, you must have loved your mother-in-law so much to have gone to such efforts to get her back home. To which the man responded, oh, oh no, you see, I heard of a man who was buried in this city many years ago, and three days later he came back to life again. Consequently, I'm not taking any chances. Well, I, I'm very sorry for the mother-in-law joke, especially because I think most probably my mother-in-law is listening to this. Please don't think I'm talking about you. Uh, but it, it is a silly joke. But actually, for that man, the resurrection was a reality, wasn't it? A and the consequences had an impact on his life, even if perhaps they aren't the consequences that we would normally speak of. More seriously, though, uh, the question of, did the resurrection really happen? A and the other question of, well, what implica implications does it have for my life? Well, those are two of the most important questions that we could ever ask. And they are questions faced by one man today in our Gospel reading. In John chapter 20, the world has been turned on its hinges. Jesus, on the first day of the new week, has been raised from the dead. Our passage there begins with ten disciples who have heard the news that Jesus has been raised, but they haven't yet seen it with their own eyes. And so there they are, they are locked away and they are fearful until, that is, Jesus stands among them. And he says those words, peace be with you, they see and they hear and so they believe in the Lord Jesus. Because he is the risen saviour, they can now be sure that their sin has been paid with, that they can be at peace with God rather than enemies, because Jesus lives. But there was one man, a man called Thomas, who wasn't in that room that night, who hadn't yet seen and heard, for whom the resurrection had not yet become a reality, and for whom the implications of that had not yet been felt. And as the second part of our passage begins, well, as the disciples break the news to him, they say, verse 25, we have seen the Lord, but Thomas is having none of it. Uh, Thomas has been made out to be uh, the original modern man, a, a rationalist, that unless it can be proved by sight, well, it's not worth believing. Certainly that is how uh, modern thought often works. And we see here, don't we, first, Thomas saying, I will not believe. I will not believe, he says. But actually, I'm not quite sure that Thomas is the modern rationalist we make him out to be. Uh, Jesus himself had already told the disciples he would die, but Thomas up until now has been a loyal, if somewhat pessimistic, disciple. 
He was even willing to die with Jesus. I wonder whether more, just that the events of the past few days, that with them the bottom has fallen out of his world and he is despondent, he is depressed and so he is doubting. Oh yes, he, he should have believed his friends. Jesus had told them that he would rise, but for whatever reason, Thomas won't believe. He's unconvinced. He knew that Jesus has died, and we've been to enough funerals to sadly know that dead people stay dead, and Thomas expected Jesus to stay dead too. Only if he had concrete evidence, a personal encounter with his friend Jesus again, only on that basis will he believe. And so verse 25, we see his terms. They're pretty gruesome, aren't they? Unless I see the nail marks and put my finger there, I will not believe. I wonder if you feel some sympathy with Thomas, that actually he's made a very sensible choice. I don't know if you can remember back to 1967 and perhaps the greatest hoax that has been played on television. The BBC aired a spoof documentary on April Fool's Day of that year about the spaghetti harvest in Switzerland. They even had the trusted Richard Dimbleby to narrate it and they showed pictures of women up ladders picking spaghetti off the trees and put it into their baskets. Uh, spaghetti was not as common a food for us then as it was now, and so many people fell for it, hook, line and sinker. So much so that in the time afterwards, the BBC were contacted by numerous people asking where they could get seeds so that they could grow their very own spaghetti trees. They had been taken in. And of course, it does show that we all can be gullible. And maybe you feel that that is what Christians are like. That they've taken something on trust without the slightest bit of evidence to believe it. And we've got to be honest, haven't we, that that is sometimes true. There are some Christians who say that they believe what they believe, not because they've looked into the evidence but to, rather because they feel that's what they should believe, or, or, or because, well, that's what they've been told to do, whether that's by a parent or a, a minister. They believed it, but without thinking it through. Of course, it is true as well in days past that people did believe things which now we write off as simply a product of a, a wild imagination. We've, we've been able to discover the meaning behind them more. Yet yeah, it is true that we can be taken in. And maybe you think this episode about Jesus is just like that. It's a good story, but one you're not daft enough to believe. Just like Thomas wasn't. We know better. We have science. We only believe something if we can see it. That is reasonable. And in one sense, do you know, that is absolutely right. It is absolutely right that we look for evidence for what we base our life on, for what we believe. That is absolutely crucial. And so even though Thomas is rebuked, actually we might have some sympathy for him. Thomas says, I will not believe. But then something happened, something enormous that meant that Thomas had a complete change of mind. I will not believe, but then Thomas said, I will believe. And we'll come back to that in just a moment. We'll come back. Before that, we're going to sing again. And uh, we're going to sing of some other witnesses that saw the Lord Jesus risen. We sang it last week. It's such a good song. We're going to sing it again this week as we take up the women and what they found on that Easter Sunday. Let's sing together, See What a Morning. Gloriously bright. <laughs>
those wonderful verses from John chapter 20. Thomas has said, I will not believe. But then something happens so that he says, I will believe. Up until the 1500s, the accepted scientific understanding of our solar system was that the solar system revolved around our Earth. That was until a man called Nicholas Copernicus discovered that actually, no, we would got it wrong, that actually the, the solar system, including us, revolves around the sun, that the sun was actually at the centre of it all. Now, lots of people didn't believe Nicholas at first. In fact, he got quite a lot of stick for it. But he had discovered a fact. And gradually over time, as they looked at that evidence, people changed their minds. Well, that is the situation that Thomas finds himself in. The solar system around which he operates, it is going to be turned on its head. He says he won't believe that Jesus is alive. But then, of course, Jesus walked alive into the room where he was, verse 26. A week later, his disciples were in the house and Thomas were with them. And though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then Jesus said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas isn't going to fall for believing every, anything without proof, but then the indisputable facts in front of Thomas changed everything for him. The evidence he asked for, he receives in flesh and blood, literally. In fact, he had demanded sight and touch. In the end, sight was all that he needed. Now, we need to see that this wonderful episode teaches us something about God. Just how kind our God is. You see, Thomas's unbelief would have been both tiresome and provoking to God. Thomas really should have believed Jesus had already given plenty of evidence. And yet, how does Jesus respond to him? With patience and compassion. If nothing but the most gruesome evidence would satisfy then that evidence is supplied. It seems that Jesus made a special appearance to the disciples just for Thomas's benefit. It is easy sometimes for us to think that God is a hard taskmaster, that he's really only out there to get his pound of flesh. But these verses say nothing could be further from the truth. Maybe if we're honest, we are struggling to believe in our faith. Maybe struggling to believe about Jesus' resurrection. Maybe we feel a bit weak and wobbly like Thomas. Well, Thomas wasn't crushed by Jesus. Not at all. And Jesus doesn't crush us either. In fact, he is patient with us. In part, he gives us Thomas's story to help us and to strengthen us. He meets Thomas where he is, but he also moves Thomas. Did you notice Jesus' words? They are both a call to faith, but they are a rebuke too. Stop doubting and believe. And Jesus always meets us where we are, but Jesus loves us too much to leave us where we are. He loves Thomas too much to allow him to do that. You see, to stay in unbelief, Jesus knows is to follow the path that leads not to life, but rather leads to death. And he won't leave Thomas or us there. And as Thomas sees the reality of Jesus living and breathing, well, Thomas obeys. In that moment, he cries out. He believes. In fact, more than just believes, what does he say? My Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. See, Jesus in his life in John's Gospel had done all sorts of signs to reveal to the world who he is. And the resurrection of Jesus is that final revealing to us. You see, ordinary people don't come back from the dead and then live forever. Jesus' resurrection pre proves beyond doubt that Jesus really is Lord over the universe. 
That means that there is not a, a person watching this today or reading it at home who Jesus isn't the rightful ruler over, whether we recognise that or, or not. There is not a, an inch of the filed coast or the United Kingdom or the world where Jesus isn't in charge right now. In fact, Thomas grasps what is true, that he is God himself. He's the son. And that is the astonishing declaration that Thomas comes to. A and that is so countercultural. It sets Christianity apart from every other religion and, and thought message. C.S. Lewis, the writer of the Narnia books, once wrote this. If you had gone to Buddha and asked him, are you the son of Brahma? He would have said, my son, you are still in the veil of illusion. If you'd gone to Socrates and asked, are you Zeus? He would have laughed at you. If you'd gone to Muhammad and said, are you Allah? He would have first rent his clothes and then cut off your head. See, all of those people, they knew that they were not God. But here is Jesus, alive again after death, and only God, who has life in himself, is able to do that. And when Thomas says, my Lord and my God, well, Jesus doesn't tell Thomas off. He doesn't correct him and say, no, you've got that wrong. In fact, he accepts that worship, because that is exactly who Jesus is. And of course all of this is, is not some truth out there. It gets very personal, doesn't it, for Thomas? My Lord and my God. Actually, Jesus is not the one that other people follow. Rather, he is the risen one who we are called to follow. My Lord and my God. Thomas here actually is really helpful to show us what faith in Jesus actually looks like. It's easy to think that faith is a, a bit of a vague thing. That faith in Jesus is simply the same as respecting Jesus or thinking that he is a good moral teacher. Or that faith is a bit like a fire extinguisher on the wall that it is just there in case of emergencies. Or that faith is the same as, as being religious or spiritual. But Thomas shows us something different. Faith in Jesus, real faith, is faith in Jesus as the risen Saviour who died to bring us back to God. It is faith in him as Lord, as the one who gets to call the shots in our life. The one we love and serve, obey and follow. That was Thomas's faith at the end. And that is the shape of faith we are called to. As the evidence was put before him, Thomas found that. I will believe. And if you like, that is where our reading ends. Thomas says, I won't believe, then I will believe. And God ends by asking us, will we believe? Will we believe? Jesus says there to Thomas, because you have seen me and believed, Blessed are those, uh, sorry, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. Sometimes it is easy to think, isn't it? Well, I would believe if I could get to see Jesus too, just like Thomas did. But, but did you see there? Jesus says, actually, you don't need to see him with your own eyes. Faith without seeing him is possible. But actually, isn't that then back to blind faith that we've said Christianity isn't? You're believing without any shred of, of evidence. Now, notice Jesus doesn't say blessed are those who believe without evidence. Just blessed are those who believe without seeing. It's that we don't need to see like Thomas did precisely because Thomas did see. And we have his account to help us. Our passage takes us there at the end. Verse 30 and 31. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. God does not call us to blind faith. Christian faith is not blind faith. 
but he does call us to faith. We have never seen Jesus, but it is possible to have reasonable and sensible faith, solid faith. Why? Well, because of this book that is written in front of us. John's Gospel was written so that we could have the evidence that the disciples saw firsthand. At the empty tomb and the empty grave clothes, the appearance, the man who wanted evidence and got it so that we could be sure that the resurrection really is real. I'm so thankful to God for allowing us to, as it were, watch over the shoulder of doubting Thomas, so that because he got the tough evidence that he needed, I too can be sure. Of course, in all areas of life, we rely on things that we have never seen, but for which there is evidence that others have seen. Every day, up and down our land, juries in court make big decisions based on the eyewitness evidence of others. And there are places in the world that I have never been to, but I believe that they are there because others I know have seen them. I've never been to Niagara Falls or Machu Picchu or, or many other places, but because others I trust have been there and told me, of course I trust that they are true. And that is true here, because Thomas saw, God says, we can believe. Will we believe? But it's not just the truth under question, it's the implications as well. Notice at the end there, that by believing, you may have life in his name. That is what is on offer here. Eternal life. That is not just de life after death. You know, pie in the sky when we die, not at all. But real life as we were made for, true life that begins now and continues into eternity. Being with God now and then one day being with him personally in that new creation that he is going to make. It is an amazing offer and it's offered to you and to me. Of course, the difficulties of trust can be great for some. Belief can be hard. Faith is sometimes difficult. But do you notice what that verse says? The liabilities of unbelief are far greater still. To refuse to believe means that there is no life. To reject the risen Christ means we will never rise with him in eternity, but will spend eternity separate from him. But that is not what God wants for you. He, he says, will you believe? Will you see the evidence that Thomas saw? And then say with Thomas to Jesus, my Lord and my God. Because when we do, that wonderful promise of life in his name is there for you and for me. And nothing, no nothing, can ever separate us from that life that is in Christ Jesus. I will not believe. Then Thomas sees the evidence, I will believe. God says to us, will you believe? Let's pray together. Father God, we do pray and ask that you might grant us faith like Thomas. Faith that looks at the evidence, that weighs it in our minds and is able to say to the Lord Jesus, my Lord and my God, might we find life in his name for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, we're going to use the words of the Apostles' Creed to declare our faith now. Uh, the Creed is a bit like a suitcase. Uh, not that we're really able to use suitcases at the moment because we can't go anywhere. But it, it doesn't tell us everything we need to know about the Christian faith. But it tells us the really important things. If we're going on holiday, we don't take everything with us. But we, we take the really key things in, in a form that we can move around with us. Well, the Creed is like that. It says these are the really key things that we can take with us wherever we go. So let's declare our faith together using these words. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. 
he ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, those truths are, are not cold truths. They are truths that wonderfully unpack how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Jesus for us. This is a song we sing at Thursday service. We've sung it in a number of all ages. And Richard Redcliffe very kindly is going to lead us in it now. Let's, uh, if you fancy, stand up and joining in. You might remember the actions wide and long and high and deep is the love of Jesus. I think we can muddle through. Let's sing together, wide and long and high and deep. And I pray that you would know this love, and I pray that you would grow in love, and I pray that you would be filled up with the fullness of God. we've been praying in that song that we would know how wide and deep and high is the love of Christ for us and we're going to continue in an attitude of prayer now and Susan Burbeck is going to lead us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father you sent your Son into the world to be a light for all and we thank you that through his death and resurrection we can enter into a relationship with you. Thank you for your promise that you will never leave us, nor forsake us. We pray about the coronavirus situation affecting millions around the world. We pray for those who are especially vulnerable, the sick, the homeless, health professionals, care workers, the elderly, people living in difficult situations, those in financial difficulties and many more. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. 
We thank you for those who are giving care and help in our local community, thinking especially of Filed Food Bank and the Bridge Project, giving food parcels out. We also pray for our government that they may make wise decisions and give good advice. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We thank you, Lord, that so many Christian organisations are using technology to connect with people, both Christians and non-Christians. And we pray that you would use this situation to bring people back to yourself. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We also bring before you people around the world who constantly face danger, hunger, illness. And we pray, Lord, that charities who provide help and aid to these people will have the funding to be able to continue their work. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. In a moment of quiet, let's bring before the Lord those people we know who are ill at the moment, physically, mentally or spiritually. We ask, Lord, that you would comfort and heal. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Let's also bring before God those who have lost loved ones. And we pray that they might know your peace and love. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, thanks, Susan. One of the great delights of the gospel is we get to call God Father, and so we're going to pray the family prayer together now. Jesus taught us to call God our Father, and so in faith and trust we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Well, we're going to, as we go our separate ways, uh, ask for God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, for his blessing to go with us. And so let me lead us now. God the Father, by whose love Christ was raised from the dead, open to you who believe the gates of everlasting life. Amen. God the Son, who in bursting from the grave has won a glorious victory, Give you joy as you share in the Easter faith. Amen. And God the Holy Spirit, who filled the disciples with the life of the risen Lord, empower you and fill you with Christ's peace. Amen. Well, we're going to join in our final hymn now that speaks of that great joy of Jesus risen. Alleluia, alleluia, hearts to heaven and voices raised. Let's voice raise our voices together now. <laughs>
Well, our time together has drawn to an end, but uh, that doesn't mean that we have to stop being church family. Uh, Maybe think of someone today in the church family, pick up the telephone and give them a ring, and uh, we can extend our fellowship that way. Uh, Don't forget, if you're on Zoom and want to join us for that midweek prayer meeting on Wednesday evening, uh, do get in touch or follow the link if you're receiving the emails, and you'll be able to follow that along too. Uh, Do stay safe, continue to stay in, keep going. I know that uh, the novelty is well and truly worn off now, uh, but we do need to keep going together uh, to protect each other and to protect the vulnerable in our nation. So keep going. And as we go, let's keep going in the power of Christ. So with the power that raised Jesus from the dead at work within you, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Alleluia. Alleluia. In the name of Christ. Amen. Alleluia. Alleluia. Well, have a great rest of your Sunday. God bless and see you soon. Bye bye.